And I'd like to introduce Rich Asmus and Paul Chandler to talk on cautious collaboration, managing IP and open source risks and pitfalls. Thank you, Brad. Good afternoon and welcome back from lunch. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is open source, and not just open source, open source in software development collaborations. Uh, after I get done with my remarks on open source, my colleague uh, Rich Asmus will talk about uh, a relatively new uh, Defend, Federal Defend Trade Secrets Act and the way that it relates to uh, software. So I want to say, because our time is limited, I'm going to be speaking at a fairly high level about the open source risks um, and the uh, methods to mitigate some of those risks. So we're not going to get into specific cases or licenses, but if you have questions, um, we can take questions during the talk at the end or afterwards, or if you'd just like to talk more in detail about this topic. So what are we going to talk about? Let's see. Here's our agenda. We're going to start by discussing why it's important to talk about open source and collaborations now. What is open source exactly, and how is it licensed? We'll so go over some background. And then what are the key risks that customers are likely to encounter when they negotiate agreements for uh, collaborations involving open source? And next, what can customers do to mitigate some of these risks? And then, as I said, after that, Rich Asmus will talk about the Defend Trade Secrets Act and some of its implications for uh, software. Open source used to be the exception in software development agreements, but that's not the case anymore. Nowadays, it seems that almost every application uses or touches open source. We need to be aware of the risks because of that. If you look at these statistics that uh, were gathered by Black Duck, which is a leading uh, source code audit firm in the area, they found that on average 36% of the code base that they analyzed contained, uh, uh, consisted of open source code. And out of 1,000 applications, 96% of them had open source components. Similarly, Forrester Research, another industry uh, research firm, found that 90% uh, of new application code is open source. Put another way, that means that in software development products, projects rather, you can expect that somewhere in the neighborhood of 10%, only 10% is custom code. And this is consistent with what we're seeing in our deals when we do uh, software collaborations. Open source is everywhere. Uh, it's extremely important. Why is that? Well, for one thing, there's so much good open source out and available on the Internet to be downloaded for effectively free. Um, companies that are collaborating on software recognize the benefit of using open source and that uh, it helps with project uh, budgets. Um, it helps meet project timelines because you're not starting from scratch to develop custom code. And for the same reason, it can reduce the technical risk in the project because you're not starting from scratch. But beyond all that, and now more than ever, we're finding that open source represents key core technology in many areas of industry. So for instance, you have Apache Web Server, which is a dominant project, Hadoop for big data management and structuring. Uh, everybody knows and uses, if you have a smartphone, Linux and MySQL. So what that means is that customers may not have the options of avoiding using open source that they once had, and that makes understanding the risks even more important. Now, while companies have been uh, pretty quick to appreciate the advantages of using open source, they've been less uh, adept at understanding the risks. And while open source is free, it's not without restrictions. It is governed by license restrictions. So here's some more research to put this in context. Let's see. 
maybe having a little trouble advancing. Okay. Here we go. Sorry about that. According to a recent survey by Northbridge and Black Duck, about half of the company surveys surveyed did not have policies for approving open source, or if they had policies, they didn't enforce them, or they lacked uh, processes for even tracking open source usage. So this is this is the problem. It's it's the failure to appreciate the consequences of using open source that can lead to such problems. And uh, tech, no, tech lawyers involved in software collaborations need to understand what they are. Before we get into the details, I want to summarize some of the problems that can result. So I mentioned legal problems. You could be named in a uh, suit for noncompliance with an open source license. That could involve claims for both copyright uh, patent infringement, and also breach of contract claims. If your company is involved in M&A activity, nowadays it's very common for purchasers and M&A deals to be very sophisticated uh, when diligencing uh, uh, open source <clears throat> used in systems at the company. And if you don't have the information to be able to respond to those uh, queries, you could be at risk for agreeing to the rep and, and uh, uh, being subject to a claim of fraud if the rep isn't true, or if problems are found that could result in a reduction in uh, the value of the deal to deal with remediation costs. And as Rich will talk about uh, later, uh, failure to appreciate the risks of copyleft licenses can lead to loss of uh, trade secret protection. In addition, if you're not compliant with uh, uh, open source license, you may find yourself having difficulty enforcing your rights in your own proprietary software that contains that code. I mentioned remediation costs. That really means uh, fixing the software to uh, either take out the open source that's embedded in it or fix the problem somehow. I did a deal a couple of years ago involving medical devices where uh, there was used uh, embedded open source quite a bit. And the client was concerned that as part of the remediation cost, they may have to redo FDA certification of the devices. So this can be an enormously uh, troublesome problem. And then security vulnerabilities. If this code is getting into your products, your systems, there are oftentimes unpatched uh, security vulnerabilities, which uh, can uh, expose you to uh, risk. So. Now that we've talked about why we're talking about open source, what is open source? Maybe the best way to describe open source is to compare it against the continuum of other software license models. There's no explicit, precise definition of open source, um, but people understand it to be a software licensed under an open source license. So what does that mean? Well, if you start with commercial uh, or closed software licenses that you may be used to, these licenses have the characteristic of uh, only providing executable code. That's the code that computers can read. It's not human readable. It's uh, licensed only for internal use. There's no modification rights, no distribution rights, and usually it comes with a license fee. That's the basis uh, of the bargain back to the supplier. Importantly, you don't get source code. Open source, by contrast, gives you source code, and it has much broader freedoms. You have the right to modify the code, to redistribute the code to anyone you want. There's no limitation on scope of use, could be internal use or any use, generally no license fees. And does everybody understand what source code is? Okay. But one thing to keep in mind is that while the rights to use open source code are broad, they're not unlimited. There are restrictions in the agreement. And people oftentimes confuse open source with public domain software. They're very different things. Unlike public domain software, open source is subject to a copyright and it cannot be used as, as, as however you want. So I said a moment ago that there's no precise universal definition of open source. 
uh, and that's true. But people in the open source world look to two organizations for uh, coming up with what qualifies as an open source license. These are the Free Software Foundation and the OSI. And the criteria that each organization uses is listed on the screen. I'm not going to go through them all. They largely reflect the characteristics that I just uh, discussed on the prior slide. And they overlap a lot. The reason why I'm bringing them up is because you need to understand that there's a lot of debate in the open source world about the interpretation of licenses and uh, the scope of obligations uh, and the like. And, and uh, unfortunately, not a lot of case law to help uh, answer these questions. And these organizations have very different perspectives on what the right answer is. So the Free Software Foundation views itself as a social and moral movement to eliminate its enemy, proprietary closed software. They're, they're big advocates of copyleft licenses. They want software to be free. And they created the GPL family of licenses. The OSI, on the other hand, is a more pragmatic business-focused group that's aimed at spreading and encouraging the adoption of open source software. And uh, we often see in a, the contracts that we do, the OSI criteria used as the basis for uh, defining open source. So over the years, the open source movement has developed many, many different open source licenses. In fact, the, the OSI's website has over 80 licenses certified as open source. Some estimate that there are thousands of licenses that would qualify as open source licenses out there. And while the terms of the licenses vary, uh, there is one differentiator that's gotten the most attention among people that work in this field, and that is whether or not the license requires you to, if you make modifications to the source code, to distribute those modifications in source code form under the same license. This is something that Joe Pinnell referred to earlier in the IoT uh, context. So, for example, if you license a package under a particular license and your developers modify that package, uh, if you share that code with others, are you required to do it under the same license you got the original code and in source code form. This is a very significant issue for companies because what happens or what could happen is if your developers combine your proprietary code, code that could contain trade secrets, with open source code under such a license and they make it available to others, they might be required under the terms of that license to provide the finished product in source code form to the world which is a very easy trap for companies to fall into when your developers download code from the internet. All they know is it's there, it works, and it's free, and they use it in products without a formal legal review. Paul, could I ask a question? Sure. When a company finds open source code in one of their uh, code bases, how do they know what license it's licensed under? Generally, open source code uh, licenses are contained in each individual file comprising a package, and there may be hundreds. And they may be different depending on different parts of the package. The user interface <clears throat> may have a different code from a, uh, an analytical engine. So I'll talk about that in a moment. So this requirement is referred to as copy left. And that, as you can all tell, it's a play on words instead of copyright. And the, the play is that it's using the power of uh, copyrights not to restrict distribution and modification of code, but to require it. And so this is sort of an ingenious way to perpetuate the, what the Free Software Foundation would, would say or call the freedom of the code. No one will stop it. It'll be free forever because if you change it and you give it to somebody else, they have to change it and make it available in the same way and on and on. And everybody, in theory, everybody benefits from this. This is referred to as, as I said, copyleft, reciprocal. People that don't think as highly of this idea call them viral. And that reflects the fear that these license terms will infect any proprietary code that they come in contact with. Um, something to note, this is usually only triggered by distribution of the code, which means that if you use 
uh, your modifications of that open source, copyleft open source code internally, you don't share it with others, you should be able to keep it private. That's a big point for companies. But it's not always the case. There are some licenses that say that if the code, if the modifications are made available over a network, then such as a software as a service, then you must also share them. And they can also uh, prohibit charging license fees. Oops, pardon me. Now let's delve a little bit deeper than you may have heard before into copyleft licenses. Copyleft licenses can be thought of in three groups, strong, weak, and no copyleft or permissive. Weak is called weak because the copyleft requirement, this viral or share and share alike requirement, only extends to modifications that are made to the original code files, which is interesting because that provides a mechanism to avoiding the copyleft effect by instead of putting your proprietary modifications into the same file, keeping them separate and, and operating the application through links. But that approach only works if the lawyers and the programmers know about it. And if they're not aware of the issue, they're gonna do what makes sense to them at the time, which uh, takes away that benefit. Strong copyleft is, is different. It goes far beyond weak in that the copyleft effect doesn't just apply to the modifications you make to the original code, but depending on the license, it can apply to code that's merely linked with that code or applications that contain that code or larger works that are based upon that code. Now think about that for a second. That means that if you didn't modify, even if you didn't modify the open source code, you yet used it in a larger application and you share that with somebody else, the entire application, all of your other modules could be internal, proprietary, could even be things you got from a third party. You don't have the source code to. By the terms of the strong copyleft license, you'd be required to share that in source code form with the world under that same strong copyleft license agreement. Now, Obviously, this has generated quite a bit of debate. And in reading uh, articles and doing research for this talk, I came across one author who called this debate Talmudic debate. Uh, I have to agree, that's probably the best description of it. The people who argue against the strong copy left extent, their argument is basically this. Software open source licenses are essentially bare licenses. All they are is copyright licenses. And therefore, the extent of the restrictions in the license should not extend beyond what a copyright, has, a copyright owner has the right to give permission to do. So that is uh, display, distribute, prepare derivative works, et cetera. And if you're not doing any of those things, that extra part should be unenforceable. Uh, the proponents of copyleft licenses, on the other hand, take a different view. So the Free Software Foundation says, no, no, no. This is, these are legitimate conditions to a copyright license. There are conditional, uh, conditions to your license, and therefore they should be enforced. Uh, as I said, there's not a lot of case law on this. There's more coming, but not a lot of cases that have uh, resolved this issue. And so licensees are really left to their own devices. Uh, to decide what to do. It's interesting to note, though, that these problems with enforceability and breadth and interpretation have not stopped the strong copyleft license from becoming extremely popular. For instance, the GPL v2 license is the second most popular license out there right now, according to a Black Duck survey. Finally, you have permissive licenses, which don't have any copyleft effect, but they do contain uh, requirements that must be complied with, such as uh, including a uh, attribution notice or warranty. They're simple things to comply with, but they're important because if you don't, you could be an infringer. We talked about licensing models, we talked about open source. Now let's switch gears a little bit and look at what risks customers can expect to encounter in software development collaborations. The first one we see far too often, the customer may think, 
they're getting custom code developed because they've agreed on a price and they've agreed on functional requirements. They cannot assume that. In fact, for the reasons I stated earlier, the supplier may be expecting to leverage open source code to meet timelines, to meet budget, to reduce technical risk, or to adopt uh, a mainstream technology. And that may be what the customer wants too. That could be in the customer's interest. My point is you just need to make sure that you understand, and all too often it's not clear. Likewise, just as it's important to know if open source is going to be used in the deliverables, in the collaboration, you need to understand what licenses are involved. This is another point that Joe Pinnell brought up earlier. The licenses may have requirements that the customer cannot accept. For instance, the copyleft requirement I just described, or it may prohibit um, uh, charging of fees. Or another issue I'll talk about in a moment, the licenses may, that, that the supplier is proposing using may conflict with one another. So that's a no-go. Because the software is downloaded from the internet, unlike commercial code, you're most likely not going to have any normal licensee protections, things that would be typical in commercial license agreements. So no indemnity against infringement, uh, no guarantee as to uh, operation of the code. And because open source code is often developed in a collaborative fashion with people uh, in any a number of locations, the risk of infringement can be higher because nobody really knows where all that code came from. And likewise, there can be unpatched security vulnerabilities because just as many eyes on the code can result in improvements, it also means that hackers can have more time to study problems and infiltrate uh, systems that adopt that code. Uh, open source in your collaboration can complicate IP negotiations, IP ownership. It's not a simple saying, we're the customer, we own everything, because the supplier may legitimately want to and need to contribute back the innovations they create back into the open source product, a project rather. And even if the customer owns the innovations, uh, they may be subject to open source licenses that diminish the value of those innovations, such as a mandatory patent license. This is an important reason why, when you're doing these deals, you need to look at not just the licenses and the packages, but how changes are being engineered. Remember I talked about weak copyleft licenses having a, uh, an escape hatch if you don't put the innovations in the same file. This is the time when you're uh, looking at IP issues, for instance, to consider if that's a vehicle to uh, save some value for the customer. This is now my favorite point. We finally reached it in the talk. Uh, while there may be good reasons to use open source, many good reasons, and you'll hear them from business clients and technical clients, license compliance may be challenging. This is perhaps a giant understatement. Uh, let me start, and that, that we could spend several talks on this, but I'm, I'm going to highlight. First of all, many of the licenses read, and were, it is in fact the case, were not written by lawyers. They're written in an informal manner where key terms are not defined. So for instance, uh, distribution. Remember I said distribution generally triggered copyleft effects? Distribution isn't defined in the GPL v2. If you distribute to an outsourcer, is it distribution? If you distribute to an affiliate, have you just triggered the copyleft effect? If you sell the business, is it a distribution? It's not clear. Derivative work, not clear. And to make matters worse, there's often no choice of law provision. And there's a lack of case law interpreting uh, these uh, clauses and these licenses. But don't worry. The Free Software Foundation has FAQs and guidance to tell you just how broadly you should interpret their license. <laughs> and I, it, it takes several readings to let it all sink in. And then there are other articles uh, and other guidance uh, going the other way. The problem for the customer, for the licensee, is that unless the Free Software Foundation owns the copyright in the work in question, that guidance isn't binding in the event of a, an infringement action, of an enforcement action. Something to keep in mind. There's a big difference between the organizations that wrote the template for the license 
and the, the organizations are the people that actually own the intellectual property and they don't necessarily take the same view of things. Another point, these licenses can be extremely technical. So you may see terms talking about uh, how modules are linked together. And in the case of the LGPL license, the way that you link code determines whether or not the license stays weak copyleft or becomes strong copyleft. Very important, how many lines of header files are taken and used in another part. This means that the legal department will need to work in close collaboration with the technical resources to apply the facts of the software collaboration to the license and sort it all out. And finally, this is an ongoing problem because as we know, software is a living, breathing thing that changes and develops over time. Uh, Beyond that, once you get through the copy, uh, the risks, what's, what's uh, uh, the velvet around the, the iron fist is that many of these licenses have automatic termination. So if you guess wrong, you've just lost your license and the day after you're now a copyright infringer potentially. It may not be clear what license actually applies. How can that be? How can it not be clear what license actually applies? Well, as I said to Rich earlier, Open source packages may be comprised of hundreds of different files. Generally, the license is contained in a text file in each file. You'd have to review each one to make sure you understood which license goes with which file. Beyond that, there's a risk that the supplier in your collaboration downloaded the code from an unofficial source, and somebody may have switched out the licenses before they got into your project. Um, some licenses, have what's called revision rights, which gives the next person in the chain the right to use a different version of the license. So you really don't know which version is in play there. And then it's not on the slide, but the supplier may unwittingly give you undisclosed open source. And in that case, neither party knows of its existence, let alone what license applies. I mentioned earlier conflicts and what a conflict is. One license might say, these are the exclusive requirements that can be used with uh, open source under this license. Another license might say you must apply this attribution. Those two things can't be used together. And license conflicts in open source is extremely, an extremely common problem. In fact, Black Duck reports recently that of the projects that they review, about 85% of them have license conflicts. And the important thing for your teams to understand is we're not talking about technical problems. Technically, the code works fine together. It's compatible, everything works, the product's ready to go. The problem is entirely legal in nature. And finally, the version of these licenses count. Just because you're using GPL doesn't mean that it's comparable, uh, compatible with another GPL. Versions two and three are not compatible. We talked about compliance risks and business risks. Now consider the patent implications. This is uh, an area that doesn't get a lot of attention. Many open source licenses require distributors to grant downstream recipients rather broad patent licenses, and the terms vary. This can be a big issue for companies that have large patent portfolios because you might not have realized that you were granting all of the recipients of your product uh, these licenses, and they differ. So the Apache 2.0 and the MPL licenses say if you contribute code and distribute it, you give a patent license to that contribution, but not to the unmodified code. You could still sue for infringement, patent infringement on unmodified code. The GPL v3 takes a different approach. If you modify any of the code and distribute it, you now give all future recipients Patent licenses covered, covering the entire code base can be quite dramatic, again, if you're a company that has significant patents. Then there are licenses that don't have any patent grant. Is that good news? Well, it's good news in the sense that if you're the one who doesn't want to give the grant, that may leave some uh, avenues open to contest it. It's bad news for regular recipients because you're in the position perhaps, of having to argue whether or not there's an implied patent license and what the scope of it is. And that's something that's recently gotten 
quite a bit of attention. Many, many open source licenses include something you may not have heard of called the patent retaliation clause. So it's a really interesting one. It says your license terminates if you sue anyone for patent infringement on the code. That's simple enough. There are a lot of variations on this. So here are three variations. MPL version 1.1 says if you sue the contributor, particular contributor of the code, then you lose your license from that contributor, even if the suit had nothing to do with that contributed subject matter. The MPL v2 goes even further and it says if you sue anybody based on that code, then you lose the license to the entire code base, even if the suit has nothing to do with the contributions that are provided under that. And then the non-copy left Apache 2.0 says, if you sue anyone based on the code, you get to lose your patent license, but you keep your copyright license. The reason for going through this is to illustrate something. It's not only copy left that you need to be concerned about, because there are other effects here, and it doesn't matter if you're not distributing the code. You know, normally, we, for many years, I heard people say, well, it's not copy left and I'm not distributing, I can do whatever I want. It's not necessarily the case. Rich, maybe you could make a comment on whether these uh, retaliation clauses could impact uh, litigation strategy. Yeah, so um, topic of our talk was collaboration. I realized before the talk that Paul and I had been collaborating for 19 years now, at, at Mayor Brown, close to 19 years, and well, we always learn something uh, when we do collaborate. And one of the things that I learned from learn, uh, helping with this is that this is something that um, patent defendants will begin looking at. In other words, if there is a, a technology at issue where um, the patent covers in, in particular software code or the implementation of technology through software, uh, defendants are going to want to look at the open source code that's been used in the technology and see if there's avenues to use these as defenses in cases. It may not come up a lot, but if you're a big system integrator in a fight with a vendor, say, um, you may have all kinds of patent cross licenses throughout your business. And some of these, the most drastic of these, um, would have an impact to open source code you've taken from some of your business partners. Right. And so it's sort of like, if I get sued and I qualify as somebody who could potentially trigger a termination, the first thing I'm going to do is try to discover if there's any little landmines I can set off in your territory using this technique. The other thing which I, I was surprised to uh, recall is that, you know, it sounds like this is punishing companies that are being offensive and trying to enforce their patent rights. But again, it's not uniform in the licenses, but some of these clauses say, it doesn't only cover direct claims for patent infringement, also covers counterclaims or cross claims. So now they've removed this as a means to defend yourself as a litigation strategy. So again, big implications has nothing to do with distributing the code or uh, copyleft that you should uh, have on your radar screen potentially. Now let's switch gears and talk about what can you do to make things a bit better? Um, so the first thing is understand what open source appears or will be used in the collaboration. It sounds common sense enough, but we see many deals where this is not done. So that means you, you should be asking the supplier for what packages they plan to use, what the licenses are, reviewing the licenses. Uh, making sure that the license requirements and obligations are things that your company can accept. And then making sure that all the licenses work together because you can't depend on the supplier to do that for you. They may make a mistake and you may be left with the potential liability in doing this. And obviously in this review, if your company is in the one half of companies that Black Duck says has open source policies, you'll want to use that policy to evaluate what the supplier is telling you. And if we're talking about products that will be distributed uh, out of the company, then you're going to be doing a much more rigorous analysis. So depending on uh, what happens with that review, uh, there may be problems found and you should consider alternatives. Some open source packages are licensed under a dual license model, which means 
If you don't like the strong copyleft license, you can pay a fee and go with something more normal, more commercial. So uh, that's an option, or it may be an option to get a different package. But if you don't ask these questions and do this review, you'll never know. Finally, uh, <clears throat> in this area, attach an exhibit that documents what you've approved. I say details matter because compliance is tied to how code is engineered. And so if you've come to a level of comfort based on assumptions about how code is going to interact, that should be documented. And if it changes, that should trigger some kind of process, which brings me to my next point. It's not always the case that in collaborations, you'll know all the open source and all the uses ahead of time. Consider agile development. So the contract should have a process for managing change, managing the introduction of uh, new open source, something that relates to both your policies and maybe the supplier's policies on the subject, not just open source policies, but remember I mentioned security vulnerabilities. So any change should be vetted with the security folks to make sure that uh, threats are not being introduced. It's important for this policy to specify, <clears throat> this process to specify when consent is required. Is it only for red flag items? Is it for copyleft? Is it a Nancy Reagan just say no uh, type thing, uh, which is becoming less and less of an option. Uh, and then documentation on how things are put together could be critical for you to comply. The, the agreement should um, uh, give you everything you need to comply. Okay. We're getting close on time, so let me highlight uh, some key things. Uh, acceptance processes should include uh, the anticipation of open source problems in them. Uh, you should be considering using Black Duck, Palomita, or Fasology tools to scan the code. should have the option to do code reviews as part of your audit process. Remediation of problems found should be uh, required in the contract. And it's always good to tie milestone payments to demonstrated compliance, just as you would any other uh, acceptance criteria. Remember I talked about earlier this debate about whether or not uh, an open source license is a bare license or whether it's a uh, enforceable set of conditions. You should avoid converting one from the other by agreeing in a contract to agree to comply with all open source requirements. Last slide. Uh, indemnities and warranties. Some warranties that we see and, and recommend for customers in collaborations is the absence of open source or unauthorized, uh, unauthorized open source or uses, that the fact that it's downloaded from official sites, uh, compliance with open source licenses so you're not bearing the risk of the provider's compliance, of course, compliance with specs. There's often a contentious issue around uh, non-infringement indemnities from a supplier. And uh, it's, it's less of a showstopper, no-go issue than it once was. But at a minimum, uh, I think it's a legitimate thing for customers to ask for indemnification for packages that were selected by the supplier and any kind of modifications created by the supplier or indemnifications for the uh, supplier's failure to comply with licenses. My last point is that especially in collaborations that involve open source, indemnities are not a substitute for good warranties because while the prevalence of third-party claims is relatively rare at this point, uh, you may have uh, significant remediation costs if there's a problem found and it shouldn't only be uh, the case that you can get a remedy if you have a third-party claim. But with that, I'll turn this over to Rich to talk about trade secrets. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I don't know if Paul scared you enough about open source software. Uh, I'm going to try to scare you a little bit more, in, in particular with reference to trade secrets. And a, a lot of times the way I like to think about these risks is you imagining the conversation you have to have with your boss at work, explaining why a small piece of open source code uh, that your legal department either knowingly or unknowingly bless the use of and why that has an impact in other areas of the company. Why, for example, that suit against a key strategic competitor won't work, that patent suit won't work because of a patent ret retaliation clause. I want to talk a little bit about why uh, some of this may be a risk on the trade secrets front as well.
So uh, I want to use it as a vehicle for talking about this, the new Defend Trade Secrets Act. It's not, not all that new anymore. It's actually almost exactly a year old. Uh, May 11th of last year was when it became effective. So we'll use this as an opportunity to uh, teach you a little bit about that and also talk about the, the connections between that and open source software and how the use of open source software and the viral license terms that Paul mentioned can have an effect on your ability to enforce your trade secrets. So uh, we're going to talk about causes of action under the DTSA, uh, brief note on its impact on restrictive covenants and confidentiality agreements, talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of using it, as well as overall, and, and we, we've throughout the special considerations with respect to software and source code. Um, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this, it's this figure 85% there. Um, in 85% of trade secret cases, the alleged defendant is someone the company knows. It's either an employee or a business partner. And the analogy I, I think of here is uh, people who have kids, you know, are worried that the stranger will abduct their child on the playground, when in fact the risk is friends, families, and teachers, right? That this is the, the concept to get with respect to trade secrets. Although hacking is in the news, uh, hacking with the election, the recent uh, Microsoft vulnerability that came, came, came to the fore over the weekend, that, that's certainly a risk. But with respect to trade secrets, trade secret cases are typically about employees who've departed as well as business partners. So collaboration is a key risk for you in terms of trade secrets. It's not always about a, a foreign state actor or malicious hackers in some foreign country. It's probably somebody that you, you know and are working with. And it's a huge problem. $450 billion is an estimate of U.S. trade, uh, annual estimate of U.S. trade secret theft. So uh, trade secret litigation has been typically brought under state state rules, state courts, unless there was diversity jurisdiction, and that all changed with the advent of the Defend Trade Secrets Act. And there's been, in fact, an explosion of trade secrets litigation over the years. Uh, the, the number of trade secret cases doubled between 1995 and 2004, likely to double again through the end of this year. So what is it that the DTSA does? They created a federal cause of action for trade secret misappropriation. What that means for those of you who aren't litigators is you had an automatic entry card into federal court, even if you did not have another basis for that entry, no, no diversity jurisdiction. You could get yourself into federal court, courts with uh, judges that we think sort of pay more attention to the facts or a little, little bit more savvy. It, um, as I mentioned, it covers trade secret misappropriation happening on or after May 11, 2016, so we have roughly a year of experience under the Defend Trade Secrets Act. And software, I should mention, is oftentimes an element of a trade secret claim. It's something that can be protected through trade secret. We think of uh, software as protected through copyright, as Paul mentioned, with respect to open source software. That's certainly correct, but it's also often a valuable trade secret of the company in particular. It's the source code that is often not licensed that is, in fact, the valuable trade secret. So what does the DTSA do? It provides new remedies, uh, civil ex parte seizure, allows somebody to go into court and uh, upon the appropriate showing with no notice to the other party, allows a seizure of assets, for example, a seizure of computers that might have purloined source code on them, provides for damages as well as injunctive relief. It includes criminal remedies that the prosecutors will use. And it requires certain changes in your NDAs and your employment agreements. Now, I'll run through these pretty quickly. I think a lot of this will be familiar to you. Um, the trade secret definition under the Defend Trade, Defend trade Secrets Act is very similar to state acts. Any, really, any form of business scientific or technical information including, for example, software source code would be considered a trade secret. But, and this is critical, you need to have taken reasonable measures to protect the secrecy of that information. And the way, the way I think this fits in with open source code is if you're protecting what you want to protect as trade secrets, your source code trade secrets are infected with one of the open source viral licenses. And that is, it comes out through discovery and the, defend, the defendant learns that through discovery if you're the plaintiff find an open source license with viral terms and you have not either cordoned off the trade secret code or otherwise taken steps to eliminate the viral nature of that open source license, have you taken reasonable measures to protect that code when in fact you're under an obligation, whether or not you carried out that obligation, 
to, for example, distribute that very source code. A uh, source code that is subject to an open source viral term, I think probably almost as a matter of law, cannot be considered a trade secret. That's an important distinction to keep in mind when you're considering open source software. Uh, what is misappropriation? Uh, give you some examples. An acquisition of a trade secret by a person who knows or has reason to know that a trade secret was inquired by improper means. Uh, I'll run through some of these fairly quickly. Also, disclosure or use of trade secrets without express or implied consent by a person, for example, who used improper means to, um, to obtain it. Those are both, I think, not really a huge change in the Defend Trade Secrets Act, but are important for you to understand in terms of in enforcing trade secrets. The remedies under the DTSA are similar to the remedies under state acts. Injunctive relief, for example, you can be um, asked by a court or told by a court to stop using certain software, for example. Damages, unjust enrichment, actual losses, reasonable royalties in some cases, as well as exemplary damages. So we're, we're out of the land of contract damages into the possibility of two times compensatory damages under the Federal Defend Trade Secrets Act, as well as the possibility of um, reasonable attorney's fees, so fee shifting as, as well. And I want to talk briefly about immunities. Um, in giving additional rights to companies under the Federal Trade Secrets Act, there's also a, a sort of what you might call a take back, which is you need to have certain whistleblower immunities built into your agreements with employees. It, doesn't, it applies only to contracts signed after the effective date. But for new contracts, you need to make sure that uh, whistleblower immunities are built into your, um, into your agreements. What that means is you need to give the employee notice that certain trade secret disclosures they make, for example, in a whistleblower complaint or in response to uh, uh, a firing and anti-retaliation lawsuit are privileged under the Federal Trade Secret Act. Uh, and the penalty for not complying with those uh, notice obligations is that you can no longer enforce some of the remedies under the Defend Trade Secrets Act. So that does mean giving notice of that immunity in agreements. Uh, for example, in contractor agreements and employment agreements, you can also do that by cross-referencing a whistleblower um, a whistleblower policy that you already have, for example, an employee handbook. So to get back to the best practices and the re way they relate to open source software, what we call these sort of trade secret best practices, and a lot of them overlap with the things that Paul was talking about. Um, using designations to mark your trade secret information, including in your source code files. Uh, reviewing confidentiality agreements with employees, consultants, and contractors. I think the open source review as part of a contracting or collaboration process goes hand in hand with trade secrets best practices. Again, having a policy on OSS, OSS use is certainly part of this. In other words, if you don't have those policies in place, it's really not best practices from a trade secret perspective either. Limiting access to people with a need to know. Again, I think it's a common sense practice, but it'll go a long way to show that you've taken reasonable measures uh, to protect your trade secrets. And I add on that, um, not only are um, employees using open source software, as Paul mentioned, they also may be contributing to open source projects, either on the side of their business um, on, on the side in their spare time, or maybe even in a way that's sanctioned by the company. They want to give their developers uh, room, room to in, uh, explore professional opportunities. There also needs to be a policy about contribution to open source projects, again, because it's possible that um, those contributions may, in fact, be valuable source code. It dealt with a matter just a couple weeks ago for a company that found out and it departed employee who was a developer had posted what they considered proprietary code onto GitHub as part of, uh, and I think it was an innocent, an innocent mistake. But that's the kind of thing that you'd want to have a policy about to make sure that the, the whole open source culture is uh, taken into account. I mean, Paul described it as sort of a, at least with respect to the Free Software Foundation, sort of a, a moral view that information wants to be free. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that's really completely incompatible with trade secret protection. So I think part of this needs to be training of developers in what they can post on a shared website, what they contribute to a joint project, and how they operate open source software, uh, both with respect to stuff, stuff they're using and things that they're putting out into the world.
Uh, so some advantages of the DTSA, uh, predictability is one. Federal courts have known rules and procedures, uh, more familiar with, uh, more, more familiar to, men, to many lawyers as well as broad subpoena power in the federal courts, more predictable results in, as case law develops. We've had a year of development of case law. There's been a number of cases under the DTSA involving, involving software, main, mainly procedural, um, procedural decisions, but still we've seen software cases under the DTSA. I also want you to note that the DTSA does not preempt other laws. There's still a layer of state court protection. However, I think more and more we will see trade secret cases being brought almost exclusively in the federal courts, and it will be a, a growing body of, of case law, as well as many growing pains as the courts struggle with uh, new issues under, under, the, under the federal law. Uh, a final point on the way this connects to open source software uh, is that it really needs to be an integrated approach between the way you're maintaining source code as a trade secret and the way you're dealing with open source software. In other words, you can't have those two things being thought about in isolation. Uh, the policies and procedures that Paul mentioned about open source software, they need to be filtered through a lens of the business goals with respect to your proprietary software. And if there is ever a problem in proprietary software, an employee who's left or a business partner who's absconded with code or any of the typical trade secrets issues you may find, you need to make sure that the way you've handled open source code is not an obstacle to the enforcement of those rights. And we have that. Uh, Time for questions as well. As well. Jump now. So I am curious, based on how open source has come up in my deals, um, have either of you guys actually seen a good open source policy from a client before? I'm just genuinely curious. You know, are are, are companies on top of this, or is this like? They're, they're suddenly realizing open source is everywhere and this is kind of greenfield and people really haven't started developing this. Or have you seen actually clients that have good open source policies already in place? Um, I'll say two things. I, I think the, um, <clears throat> the Black Duck uh, summary speaks to, the survey results speak to the challenge for companies to get that in action. They, as I said, they found that about only one half of companies surveyed had a policy and or enforced the policy or even understood. And it's so critical. And as to companies that we've seen that do have policies, I think it's important to note that those policies tend to be very much tailored to their businesses. So I'd love to tell everyone, we got a policy, use it, you're covered. But it really, uh, it's incumbent upon the, the company to look at their objectives, how they manage their intellectual property, and then generally set out the green, you know, yes, no, maybe type categories of, of open source. It's a big deal. I, I would say where I've seen it the most developed, which is probably a nice segue into the next topic, is I've seen it quite well developed at certain clients on the M&A side. They have a checklist that they go through with respect to software company acquisitions in terms of looking for red, what we call red flag viral licenses such as, such as GPL. I, I, I've seen it less uh, in the less sophisticated versions in terms of their own internal use. Yeah, they're pretty good at ferreting out where you might be using open source and using that to drive uh, reps uh, development. That, that could be a whole nother talk. <laughs> Any other questions? So if you do come across a uh, code that's been infected, can you um, eliminate your obligation to disclose the code by undistributing it, basically, by taking it back in-house? Or is your obligation triggered, and no matter what, you have to disclose the proprietary code? Yeah, so I think that the, probably the the correct legal answer to that is you can't unring the bell. Hmm. Uh, but as a practical matter, what we've seen clients do on the M&A side typically is require the seller to do a, a pre-closing remediation of the code in question. So that it, at the very least, uh, they can try to leave that liability behind and not have it come up. I mean, if you think about the way it comes up, it's not like there's open source police out there 
uh, checking this stuff. It comes up when push comes to shove in a, in a litigation context. And so by remediating the code and at least getting rid of the problem, it may be that it never comes up. In summary, so with the copyleft GPL version two license and other GNU library licenses, is it a two-part test that there first needs to be a modification, then a distribution, or is that, is that talking about for the copyleft effect to yeah, occur? The viral, the viral nature of those licenses. I, I think if we talk about distribution, uh, if we talk about modifications, I think they look at are you distributing or not generally? But as I said, some of the license, like the Afero right. GPL, uh, simply making it available over the internet um, counts uh, as a, a copyleft requirement trigger. If you haven't made a, a modification to it, it's possible that you might still be required to make available the same original code but um, I think that would depend on the license. I don't recall on the GPL P2. Um, but the obligations around making uh, source code available and corresponding source code are also non-trivial, especially if you have a fast-moving product with changes, production changes, because that source code always needs to reflect what's in the product. That's a whole other vein of complexity, and how do you do that and for how long? So th that's why I said that in collaboration agreements, it's good to have a covenant to require the supplier to give you everything you need to comply with those types of obligations. And the second question, if you do have an obligation to disclose, is the obligation to provide it to someone upon request or is it an obligation to make it available, let's say like on GitHub or to I the I think it depends on the license. I think generally it's to make it available um, in a convenient way and, and in some cases not to charge for it. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.